where I preach, we began Sunday school at nine, and we began worship somewhere close to ten. And I tell people that gets us out, and we can get to the restaurants and meet the other people there. That's not the reason they do that. That's how that's that's how they've had service since I've been there, and however it is, that's well. But the good thing about it, it's not scriptural to eat till 12 o'clock. So I've got about an hour and 20 minutes uh, to deal with the lesson today. It's good to be with you. As I've mentioned, I've known these three right here for years. And uh, they put up with me down through years, Barry and Sandy for a number of years, put up listening to me all the time. I guess they decided they'd punish enough, they'd get me up here and punish you all a while. But I'll tell you what, it's good to be with you. I've looked forward to it and hope that our studies... I don't know what Barry did with my Tuesday night lesson, though. He said Monday and Wednesday. He skipped over Tuesday, so I don't know whether I'm going to be speaking Tuesday. No, have a service Tuesday, somebody's going to be speaking. No, I, I'm sure that, that was just the tip of the slung, a, a slip of the tongue, whichever way you want to say it. I'm going to be talking this morning about what I believe is an important study, the Christian's purpose in life. I do not believe we can accomplish anything without a purpose. All of us remember a man back in the Old Testament, the name of Daniel. I'm sure the children know about Daniel, know about the lion's den. But in Daniel 1 and verse 8, I believe we find the clue to why he was so faithful to God. He purposed in his heart. He was not going to eat the king's dainties. In other words, he was going to do what was right, regardless of what anybody else did, regardless of what they said. Even when he was threatened with a den of lions, he still was going to do what God said. But it all came back to the fact that he purposed in his heart. Folks, if we make up our mind, we're going to serve the Lord faithfully. Nothing in life is going to interfere with that. So there are a number of points I want us to think about this morning. They're very simple points so we can all understand them. What is the number one purpose in life? Make up my mind, I'm going to live right. In Titus 2, began verse 11, the Apostle Paul said, For the grace of God that brings the salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Folks, we have the one shot at life. How we live on this earth is going to determine where we're going to be in eternity. And this lets us know that we're to live soberly, righteously, and godly. In Romans 12, Paul said, I beseech therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be you transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Paul said, we've got to get our thinking right. Folks, if I'm going to talk right, if I'm going to live right, I'm going to have to have my thinking right. You know, sometimes people say, I don't know how that word slipped out of my mind. I'm going to have more to say about that later. Because I'm going to talk about where to talk right. But the point is, people say, I don't know how that came out. It's in our mind. I cannot say anything that's not in my mind, right? How can I say words I don't even know? I tell people sometimes English is foreign language to me. But I'll tell you this, if we make up our minds, I'm going to live right. In Philippians 1.21, you know what Paul said? For me to live is Christ. Then notice the rest of it. And to die is gain. He simply says, if I live for Christ, it'll be a blessing to die. If we're faithful children of God, we won't have anything to worry about. Romans 8 and verse 1, There's therefore now no condemnation of them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after flesh, but after the Spirit. That means I'm not going to live as the flesh directs. I'm going to live as the Spirit directs. How does the Spirit direct through the Word? That means I'm going to live my life based upon that. In fact, in Romans 8 and verse 13, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit to mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Paul said, we're going to have to live right. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. 
Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He simply says, I am going to live like Christ wants me to live. In Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Would you not say the majority of people in our world are living for things? The things of this life? I heard of a lady one time who was said to have made this statement. She said, I'd rather have my riches and my pleasure in this life than go to heaven when I die. You talking about somebody blinded by the God of this world? That's a person who's blinded by the God of this world. Folk, if I live to be 900 years old, what is that compared to eternity? Methuselah lived 969 years. What's that compared to? Eternity is forever. And if we need to be convinced that we're going to be in that eternity, even in heaven or in hell, and yet the majority of people living for what? For now. What I can get out of life right now. We need to be concerned about the hereafter. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Colossians 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, he's our example, he's the one we're to follow, and when he shall appear, he said, Then shall I appear with him in glory. In Acts 11, 23, Barnabas, with purpose of heart, he said they would cleave to the Lord. We need to live right. What's my purpose in life as a Christian? To live right. Number two, to think right. We are products of our thinking. I can't say a word about thinking. Maybe sometimes people say without thinking enough, but folks, you cannot say a word without thinking. In Philippians 4 and verse 8, Paul said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things have good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Paul, oh, what do we think about things true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and the good report? Let's suppose everybody just thought about that. Prayer while go for those who are fighting for us, really, that we might be able to have the privilege we have right now. Let's suppose everybody thought about things of a true, honest, just, pure, and loving, and good report. There wouldn't be any war. There wouldn't be any crimes. Every time you turn on the television, some kind of crime has been... Did y'all happen to see... Just the other day, a young lady, I believe there were three children in the car with her, an older lady, 81 years old, was driving too slow. Did y'all see that on news? She beat that, old, that lady to a pump, broke her leg in about, what, about six places, her leg broken. You're going to have to have a new knee put in. Just because she was driving too slow to suit that woman. What in the world is wrong with the world in which we live? When people who don't like somebody driving too slow decide to stop them and beat them up. And that was a, a young lady. Let me take that word lady out. A young person. She wasn't much of a lady for sure. But the point is, that's the kind of world we live in. You know, in Romans 8 and verse 7, Paul said the carnal mind is empty with God. You show me a person who thinks only about the things of this life, they're not concerned about serving the Lord. They're not concerned with what the Lord wants a person to do. In fact, in James 1 and verse 8, Paul, uh, James talks about a double-minded man is unstable. A person who's double-minded, not thinking as they ought to think, they're unstable. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 talked about in whom the God of this world hath blinded the mind of them to believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ and the image of God should shine unto them. He said... People's mind is blinded. You know who blinds people? The devil. Blinded by the God of this world. Folks, if we're going to be what God wants us to be, we're going to have to live right. And if we're going to live right, we're going to have to think right. In Colossians 3 and verse 2, Paul said, Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Let me ask you a question. Wouldn't you say the majority of people's life is wrapped up with what's on this earth? 
What can I get out of life? What can I have? What can I own? What will please me? You know, if we get rid of me, I believe we'd be better ready to serve the Lord. But too many people, what I want, and my affections on things of the world. So we have to make up a mind, I'm going to live right. I'm going to think right. Number three, I'm not talking right. I'm amazed at the language that I hear. You know, there's a country music song, very popular. Had a good message in it. This fellow heard his young boy say a word. And he asked him, where did you hear that? He said, I've been watching you. Well, according to the song, the fellow prayed that night that God would help him to overcome those things. Well, when the little boy got out of bed, got on his knees and started praying, he said, where in the world did you learn? He said, I've been watching you. You know what the message is? Children watch their parents. And they act like and they talk like what they see and what they hear. Well, where else are they going to learn? I have seen children that tall as old sand goes could not curse a sailor. I don't know why in the world they, I don't know why sailors curse it more than anybody else. But I've heard the expression, man, they now curse a sailor. Where did they learn it? Learn it from the parents. You know, it's sad if we don't talk. You know what the psalmist said? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. This is the heart that God's concerned about. I don't know how many of y'all knew Brother Marshall Keeble when I was young. I used to go hear him preach. He made me mad every time I heard him preach. He was a black preacher. He made me mad every time I heard him preach. Somebody said, why did he make you mad? I said, he quit. I didn't want him to quit. I said, listen to him all night. But I'll tell you what, he said one time, he said, God is concerned about the heart that's above the collar. That's right. When I was 40, which was 31 years ago last March, I had a heart attack. I know about heart attacks. I got lost my dad at 40 with a heart attack, my brother at 31 with a heart attack, and I was 40 when I had mine. So I know all about heart attacks. I, I'm kind of concerned about this heart. Do you know where I really need to be concerned about this heart of people? This heart up here directs my thinking, my talking, my action. Everything comes from that heart. Our talk comes from heart. Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I mentioned a while ago, people say, how in the world did that ever come out of my mouth? Folks, words don't come out of our mouth that aren't up here. And sometimes people let them slip out. And they wonder how in the world that ever came. It's because their thinking not right. I'll tell you how, how important it. Matthew 12, 37 says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Folks, that, that's pretty serious, isn't it? You mean my mouth can cause me to be lost? That's what it says. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That shows me how what we talk, how what we say is important. And yet people say, I just say whatever's on whatever is on my mind. I've heard people brag about that. You know, sometimes they may be on our mind, we'd be better off keep a mouth shut. Think back through life. What has gotten you in more trouble than about anything? This thing called a mouth. Can it get us in trouble? Sure can. And I'll tell you what, according to the Bible, it can get us into eternal trouble if we aren't careful about how we talk, how we speak. So, as a Christian, I make up my mind, I'm going to talk right. Well, number four, I'm going to do right. I'm going to do what's right. Matthew 7, 12, all things therefore whatsoever. Well, let's just turn and read Sometimes I start quoting a passage and it, it doesn't come out like I want it to. Therefore, all things what said ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is long problem. Let me ask you a question. Wouldn't that solve a lot of problems in our world if everybody treated everybody like they want to be treated? That solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? As a matter of fact, would there be any wars right now? If everybody treated everybody like you want to be treated? 
then isn't that what that's saying in, in substance? You treat people like you want to be treated? Now it amazes me that people think of self, whatever I want, whatever I, however I want to live, whatever I want to do, I have the right to do that. You know, God lets us live like we want to. He lets us talk like we want to, but all the time that we're doing that, we must remember someday we're going to have to give an account for it. Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It speaks what's in our heart. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, do not the things I say? Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone saith unto me, Lord, Lord, send in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Jesus said we're to do the will of the Father. And I'll tell you what, if we're going to be judged by what we do and be judged by what we say, we'd better be careful about what we're doing. Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates in the city. Who's going to heaven? Those who do the will of the Lord. That's what that says. Those who are going to enter into heaven are those who do the will of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 15, Be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Folks, we have to make sure that we do what's right. In the fifth place, we need to make sure that we die right. No, it doesn't matter whether we die rich or poor. It doesn't matter what kind of condition we're in. What makes the difference is whether or not we die right in the sight of God. Remember what Balaam said to Balak, Numbers 23 and verse 10? He said something that all of us need to be concerned about by doing. He said, let me die the death of the righteous. Great statement, isn't it? Let me die the death of the righteous. How can we die the death of the righteous? If we live the life of the righteous. That's the only way we can die the death of the righteous. If we live righteously, why we live on this earth? In Revelation 14 and verse 13, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Yea, henceforth saith the Spirit, They may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. If we do what? If we die in the Lord. You know the only way to die in the Lord is to live in the Lord. The only way we can live in the Lord is to be in the Lord. The only way we can be in the Lord is to obey the gospel which puts us into Christ. And this says that we are to die in the Lord, and if we do, then we can rest from our labors and our works do follow us. I would say death is looked at as a loss. Earlier in the lesson, Philippians 1, 21, Paul said, For me to live is Christ. Now, for the last point that we're talking about, he said to die is gain. I doubt very seriously that most people look at death as a gain. But Paul did. I'll tell you what, when Paul knew that his time was at hand, that he was going to depart this life, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, that is in view of that, there's a crown of righteousness laid of me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but in all them also who love his people. Paul said, I'm going to be saved, and those who love his, who, who will love the appearing of the Lord? Those who are prepared for it. Not those who are unprepared. It's going to be the worst of all days when the Lord comes in judgment if we're not prepared for it. But if we're prepared for it, it will be the greatest of all days. In Psalm 116 and verse 5, the psalmist said, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What's precious in the sight of the Lord? Death is saints. We don't look at death as, as a blessing. I'll tell you what. I've seen people suffering and suffering 
who are faithful children of God. And I'll tell you what, it was a blessing for them to draw their last breath. They could get out of this world of misery, pain, and agony, and have the world filled with sin. I'm amazed in my lifetime, in fact, the last several years, how the morals of this country have degenerated. When I was growing up, in school, teachers had had permission to to spank children if they did. I think that's pretty well taken away. You're not, you're not there to, to spank the child. Do parent may come down. In fact, a fellow told me one time, he spanked a little boy. And he said, that little boy said, I'm going to get my daddy. He said, after a while, a fellow came in, had to buy him to get in the door. This fellow, the teacher, wasn't, he was about that tall. I don't guess he, he wasn't even taller than that. He said, that fellow came up to us and said, did you spank my boy? He said, yes, sir, I sure did. He said, what would you spank him for? And he told him. He said, what would you spank him with? He told him. He said, let me have that. He said, if I don't know, boy, I'm going to get a good beating now. He said he never saw a boy get such a whipping in his life. He don't tell him what he went home and told his daddy. And his daddy came down there ready to whip the teacher. And when he found out why the teacher whipped the boy, the boy got another whipping. He said he didn't have any more trouble out of that boy after that. I'll tell you what. The old saying, he that spares the rod spoils the child goes a long way. We need to be sure that we think right, that we talk right, that we act right, that we die right, because our eternal destiny is at stake. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What what have you purposed in life? We talked about what the Christian's purpose in life is. What's your purpose in life? What means more to you than anything else in this world? I'll tell you what ought to mean more to all of us than anything else in this world. I can't find a place to put my Bible. This second time I, I'm going to tell you, this second time I wore this suit, my pockets aren't even open to where I put my Bible. <laughs> you know, sometimes something new doesn't work out, so there's a pocket right there. So. I tell you, the way that we live our lives while we live on this earth is going to determine where we're going to be in eternity. And folks, eternity is forever. It doesn't want to go in that Lay right there. Eternity is forever. Now, it's hard for us to grasp eternity. We think of time and seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and years and all of that. I'm not involved in eternity. Time not even involved. And yet all of us are going to be in that eternity. We're either going to be in one of two places, either in heaven or in hell. And I'll tell you what, it ought to behoove us to ask ourselves a question. If I were to die today or the Lord would come in judgment today, where would I be in eternity? And whichever it is, it's going to be forever. You know, some people teach if you're lost with not paying and praying, they can get you out of it. Out of where you, where you are. I heard a fellow one time, he was a member of a group that teaches that, and they told him he'd been paying for I don't know how long, and they said, we've got your dad all out except one foot. He said, Dad can jump the rest of the way out, and he wasn't going to pay them any more money. But after enough paying and praying, they can get you out of purgatory. Folks, ain't, ain't no such thing as purgatory. When we depart this life, we either go into a place of rest, a place of punishment, and we learn from the rich man of Luke 16 exactly what, what that's all about. And i tell you what, he knew he was going to be there, and he knew that his brothers were headed that way, and he wanted... He wanted somebody to go and warn them. He's told they have Moses and the prophets. We have God's word today, and if it's believed, nobody will keep us out of that place. And we'll someday hear the Lord say, well done. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, hope that you have enough faith in the Lord to do what he said. Jesus said, except you repent, you'll perish. And that's what he meant. He said, confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. 
It was our Lord who said, He, that means anybody that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He believeth not shall be damned. You know, sometimes people say, He didn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized. Folks, here's what he said it takes to be saved. He that believeth and is baptized. You know all it takes to be lost? Just not believe. In fact, if faith must precede baptism, I've used this illustration. If I were to say, He who eateth and digesteth his food shall live, I wouldn't have to say, He that eateth not and does not digest his food, he doesn't eat nor have food to digest. But I'll tell you what, he'll die. That's for sure. No people will use ridiculous arguments. It was mentioned a while ago that I was a barber. I barbered several years there in Nashville. I was preaching while I, while I was a barber, and since 1960 I've been preaching full time. I was in a meeting one time, and one of the members knew I used to be a barber. He said, oh, don't you meet, meet my barber. Let's go talk to him. He was a member of a religious group, and we had a good discussion. I finally just opened my Bible, Acts 2 and verse 38. I said, don't you read that verse? He read it. I said, what did those people have to do? He said, repent. I said, what does the verse say? He said, they had to repent. I said, but what does the verse say? He said, they had to repent. I said, but what does the verse say? Finally, he said, that's just your opinion. I hadn't even expressed an opinion. I just asked him to read Acts 2 38. It says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sin, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ask a fellow who was a deacon, he was a manager of a radio station that I was on in years past, and ask him, he was a deacon in a religious group. I said to him, Have you ever studied the book of Acts? You know what he said? He said, Virgil, that's one book I've never studied. You know, folks, that's sad. Here's the book of conversions. And he said, I've never studied that book. It's no wonder people believe and teach and practice what they do. People say, the Lord told me to tell you this. The Lord gave me this message. I'm holding right here in my hand the total message of the Lord. Everything he wants us to know is right here. This idea that someday he's going to give other information, all of it's right here. If you've never obeyed the gospel, I hope that you have enough faith in the Lord to do what he said to do. On Pentecost, believers were told to repent and to be baptized for the remission of sin. And that's what believers today must do. Jesus said we're to confess him before men and confess him before the Father. When we have enough faith to turn from sin, confess our faith in him to be baptized for the remission of sin, the Lord led us to his church. And Revelation 2.10 says, We're faithful unto death. We'll have that crown of life. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to do that today. If as a child of God you've strayed from the fold and need to come back to repentance, confession, and prayer, you have that opportunity. We hope that you'll come as together we stand and let us stand and see.